good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday service here at Calvary Calhoun Christian Fellowship. When we start, we're going to read Isaiah 35, that great messianic passage. But while you're looking that up, a um, couple of birthdays. I think we've got uh, Linda McLeod on the 15th. I'm told that that might be a special birthday there, but I'm not sure. Um, but that, either that or I'm Anyway, 15th, Linda, happy birthday. And Esther McDermott on the 17th. I suppose every birthday is special, so we wish you a happy birthday. And if we've missed anyone out, it's probably because we don't have a note of your birthday, so um, you can let us know about that. Now, those of you who remember Neil Brownrigg and Julie Brownrigg will know that Neil died suddenly a couple of weeks ago, a week and a half ago. He was only 55. But I have a, I have a link. His, his, his funeral is in Aberdeen on Tuesday at 1.15. But I have a link. They're going to stream it live because they've got friends and family all over the world. So if you want to copy that link to watch, uh, to take part in Neil's funeral, then drop me a, an email or something and I'll send it. I can only send, I'll forward the email to you. If you just let me know you want it, and I'll send it forward to you. Um, poll updates. Well, there's no change at the moment. We're expecting government announcements this week, I think, from, from the UK government on Monday and maybe from the Scottish government on Tuesday. I don't see much happening, to be honest, guys, until maybe the middle of August. This August 9th date seems to be a, a sort of milestone, but we'll see what happens there. Um, so hopefully August, so back end of August, beginning of September, we, we should maybe get back in the hall. We could be back in the hall at the moment, but there would be a need for no music and no singing and nice. wearing masks and two metre distance and, and no Sunday school. So it's a bit of a pointless exercise. So we're as well here on, uh, on Zoom. I think that's all the announcements I have for you this morning. So let's proclaim the word of this Lord this morning here at Calvary Calhoun Christian Fellowship. Going to read Isaiah 35. The joy of the redeemed, it says here. The desert and the parched land will be glad, and the wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst forth into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands and steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, Grass and reeds and papyrus will grow, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast. Get up on it. Sorry. And no lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for your word this morning, Lord. We thank you for that great messianic prophecy by Isaiah, Lord, even 700 years before you actually set foot in this earth, Lord. And here we are being told all about it, even your first and your second coming, Lord. And we look forward to that second coming, Father. We say, Maranatha, come soon, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this morning, Lord. Here and now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we gather. Although it's only virtually, Lord, only in pictures and in sound, Lord, we, we thank you for that, Lord. I don't know how we would have managed it, Lord, without the technology over this last 18 months. So we bless you for that, Lord, and we thank you for it. And I thank you for all who have gathered here this morning, Lord. And for those who couldn't come, I know there'll be many on holiday, Lord, and many 
have your plans made, Lord. So we ask you to bless them, whatever they are, and keep them safe and watch over them. And as we come this morning, Lord, we ask that you would just bless Robin as he leads us in praise and worship and for calling as he brings your word and shares it with his father, that it may indeed be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path, Lord. And I just thank you for all the people who are part of our fellowship here in Kaloop, Lord. Everyone, Lord, who has ever been a part and whoever will be, and especially those who are a part now, Lord, we just pray that you would bless us, Lord, as you always do. Watch over us and keep us. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us, for food to eat and for air to breathe, Lord, for the wonder of salvation that's alive and well in our lives, Lord, for your indwelling Holy Spirit. So, Lord, be with us as we continue, as you always are. A touch us with your spirit, Lord. Inspire us and lift us up, Father, for we do ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Robin now. He's going to lead us in praise and worship this morning. So I'll give, give you over to Robin. Well, good morning. That just reminded me, I know chorus we used to sing. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall be singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. If anybody's that old, they can remember it. Anyway, that's not what we're singing this morning. <laughs> so, we're going to start with singing Graves in the Gardens. It's a kind of a new song. Well, I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough and then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Well, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all. And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley There's not a place your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you no there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn mourning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You're the only one who can You're the only one who can Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you. No, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than 
into gardens You turn bones into highways You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You're the only you're the only one who can Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Turn your eyes to the hillside Where justice and mercy embrace There the Son of God gave his life for us And our measureless dead was erased Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes. Turn your eyes to the morning And see Christ the Lion away What a glorious dawn Fear of death is gone For we carry His life in us Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the heavens Our King will return for His own Every knee will bow Every tongue will shout All glory to Jesus alone Jesus to you lift our eyes, Jesus our glory and our pride, we adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true, oh Jesus, we turn our eyes to you, Jesus to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our pride, we adore you, behold.
behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Yes, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, and you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. And I'll never know. How much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. No, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Oh, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross oh i'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely. Altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Lord, we just thank you this morning. We praise you and we thank you that without you we'd be nothing. So we come to worship you and to bow before you this morning, to proclaim that you are our God and that you, you have known us from the beginning of time, Lord, and that we are your children. So we bless you for that this morning. We thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your love, for your mercy, for every good thing that we have in our lives. 
but it all comes from you. And Lord, we just, we thank you that you're there for us in the good times, Lord, but you're also there for us in, in the trials that we go through at times as well. You never leave us, you never forsake us, you're faithful to us forever. So let us just turn our eyes on you this morning as we come to to hear from your word, as we come to bring our prayers and petitions to you, Lord, we thank you for, for this meeting, we thank you for everyone that's tuned into this meeting this morning and we do ask father that you would bless us as we as we join together um it's not the same as being together physically lord but it's good to know that we are one in the spirit here as we join together so we bless you and we thank you we pray for colin we thank you for him lord for setting us up for jim lord for his leading here and we pray for your word lord as as we open your word, Lord, that uh, you would speak to us through that this morning. So we bless you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry, sorry Colin, I, I think I might have um, got, you, got you a bit confused. We didn't have the words for the last one. <laughs> sorry. I will re we'll remember it well, Robin. A great song. It's an old song, I'm sure, I'm sure you knew it. I all knew it. A great time of worship. Thank you, Robin, for that. We'll just hand over to Colin now. The Lord bless you, Colin. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Jim. Morning, everyone. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3 this morning, if you want to find yourself at 2 Timothy chapter 3 for today. So this is a letter from the Apostle Paul to, to Timothy, a letter that Paul pens from prison. And despite his, his position when he penned this letter, it is really a letter of encouragement to Timothy and to us today. I suppose prison is the last place you expect encouragement to come from, but there you go, that's the Apostle Paul for you. So throughout this letter that he, that he gave to Timothy, he's assuring Timothy of his, his love and his prayers and reminding Timothy of his responsibility and his, his spiritual heritage as well. To encourage Timothy to persevere, to be a good soldier for Jesus, to be that good athlete running the race of faith, to be a good farmer, to plough and to sow and to do the spiritual things in that kind of farming analogy. And above all things, to be a faithful minister for Jesus Christ. But against all that, there's the backdrop of kind of growing oppression, which Paul is speaking of as well. And as we come to chapter three today, I'll be able to speak into our current situation, our current world affairs today as well. We see in this chapter, in chapter 3, how the Apostle Paul would speak about the last days. And it really gives us a glimpse into the heart of man. And those in these times who would seek to lead others down wrong paths as well. So we can read from verse 1 to 9 of chapter 3. It's not really going to be our, co our context or the main passage of study, but it will give us a kind of background that we're looking at. So chapter 3, verse 1 to 9. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For this sort are those who keep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Yanis and Yambres resisted Moses, so did these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be made manifest to all, as theirs also was. So as we look at that wee passage there, so know this, know this, I say, know this is going to be, that in the last days perilous times will come. So I'm sure we all, all agree that we are in the last days. I suppose every age has said that, we're all in the last days before Jesus comes back. But we can clearly see the selfishness of mankind, how our world is getting progressively worse and worse. And we see this kind of list of characteristics in chapter 3, this rather dire list of, kind of characteristics and natures that we can see. 
we see that today in the world, all these kind of things that are listed in this character, this passage here. You know, we see the lovers of pleasure rather than the lovers of good. We see the, the disobedience and unthankfulness, ungodliness in our culture and our world today, and how it is getting worse and worse as well. People in their pride and their disobedience, their lack of self-control, we see all that happening. But we also see there's a cloak of religion today as well, that some people claim godliness, some people claim faith, but it is a form of godliness, but they're really lacking the power, they're lacking the true truth in it. And essentially there's that empty shell, an empty shell of some form of godliness, but it's an outward facade, an outward shell, and there's really nothing inside other than unholiness and darkness. So the Apostle Paul is using these dark words as a warning, but he turns back after this passage here, after that word, and he follows it through with a strong encouragement to Timothy, with that as the background. So chapter 3, verse 10, Paul continues, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. So first of all, we see how Timothy's past conduct and his character stands in stark contrast to the kind of false teachers and all these kind of, kind of bad, this bad list of characteristics that we read in the start of the chapter here as well. We see that Timothy is, had faithfully followed Paul's correct doctrines, followed Paul's manner of life, followed Paul's purpose, Paul's faith, Paul's long-suffering, his love, his perseverance, and even into the persecutions and the afflictions that Paul suffered for his faith. So we see that, first of all, the Apostle Paul has got that, that great spiritual character, but he's following after the things of God. He's got things right, and Timothy has followed after Paul. He's been with Apostle Paul for many years, and they literally went through good times and bad during that time together. If there was anyone who would know the Apostle Paul well, it would be Timothy having spent all that time with him. And what the Apostle Paul was doing was giving Timothy this loving example. Timothy was his spiritual son in the faith, and he was showing Timothy how to live his life, how to imitate him. As 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that really is that spiritual, that scripture being shown in action between Paul and Timothy, that Paul gave Timothy that, that great character, that great example for him to follow in. So with that in mind, I suppose off the bat we can consider this. How would that be if we applied it to our lives? If our family members, if those that we know round about us, had to read our way of life, had to imitate how we live out our lives, what kind of example would we be showing? And would we be happy for them to follow us and to imitate everything that we do? Would that be the type of person we'd want to see them, we'd want them to be? Or is there something within our lives and the way we're living our daily lives we know it's not quite right and we know that we should be showing a better example? The best type of Christianity is not only taught, but it's also caught as well. People should catch it by seeing how we live out our lives. They should see something in us that they ignite something in them. They, they catch a, a desire to live out a, a life the same way. They catch a desire to, to have the same thing that we have, that kind of spiritual nature, that faith, that hope, that trust in the Lord. And as we generally show faith in action, it should not only impact us, but it should impact those around about us as well. Do they catch, they catch that desire from the example that we show them? It's so what we have internally, such as our faith, our beliefs, our values, will also be shown externally in some shape or form. At the end of the day, lamps, at the end of the day, lamps don't talk, they just shine. And our lives should shine to those around about us. Even if they never hear a word that comes out of their mouths, our life should shine Jesus in some shape or form. Our actions, our demeanour, what we do, the way we interact with people. Let's face it, we can all say the right words, but if they're coming out of a person's mouth who demonstrates a life as at odds with the words that they're speaking, will a person receive that message? If you're 
actions are saying one thing and your mouth is saying another. There's a contradiction there and people are not going to be impacted truly by the faith that we have if that is how we're living out our lives. No matter what we say, it will not be received as true and genuine because there's some disparity there. But this wasn't Timothy and it wasn't Paul either. And Timothy caught this, he caught this kind of faith, he caught this kind of desire for the Lord off of Paul in the way that Paul lived out his life. The reason that Paul lived the way he did is because he believed certain things. And again, what we believe will determine how we live as well. Timothy saw Paul, he saw Paul's way of life, his words, his actions, his interactions, Paul's steadfastness, Paul's faith, and how Paul stood firm in the face of persecution and opposition as well. You know, just think about what the Apostle Paul went through. Kept out of cities for preaching the gospel. The Iconium, it was all almost executed by stoning. At Lystra, it was stoned again and almost left for dead. And Timothy would have witnessed and known all about these things. And even in that, he'd seen Paul's steadfastness, his true determination to do the things that the Lord had called him to do. And even in these oppositions, even in these times of persecution, that was an encouragement to Timothy. Because he knew that Paul had faith. He knew that nothing would waver Paul from his faith. Nothing would steer him down a wrong path. They had this strong steadfastness faith in the Lord. So Paul continues in verse 12 and he says, Yes, and all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So again, all believers need to understand that if we are faithful, if you are faithful to serve the Lord, then we will at some point suffer persecution. And we see, you know, there's many kind of wrong teachings in the church, the whole prosperity prosperity, theology and gospel out there. We see it for the sham that it is. No matter how strong your faith is, nothing's always going to land in your lap. You know, roses and daisies and you're never going to suffer a, a wrong, difficult situation in your life. That is wrong. And we see that truly from the life that Apostle Paul led. If you're following after the Lord, the persecution will come in some shape or form. We get John 15, verse 18 to 19, which says this. It says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. So we see there, it's a wee bit of a dark, a dark scripture, isn't it? But we see the, the, the purpose in it. If we fall after the things of the Lord, there's an opposition. We're going against the flow of the world. As the world goes darker and darker into ungodliness, unholiness, we are going against the things of the Lord. Then, as we are seeking to follow the Lord, the opposition will get stronger and stronger, and we just swim against the tide of the world today. Therefore, we need to come against difficult times. But the Apostle Paul has shown us to be the people with the right doctrines, the right manner of life, to know your purpose, to have the faith, the faith in the Lord to not be wavering in it, to be long-suffering and to have love for the Lord and love for people round about us. That if we do those things, that the Lord will strengthen us in all situations. The fact is, some level of persecution is certain in this life. All those who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. We know in the world that we live in today, though, there's many people suffering severe persecution, all these persecuted countries. They will often pray about in Wednesdays and in Sundays as well. Today in the West, we're not suffering the same level of persecution, but, you know, times are getting dark and we can see things getting worse and worse, even in the country that we are living in ourselves. So following after Christ, we'll set you on a path directly opposite of the world, that we need to swim against the tide. And to swim against the tide, you need to be strong, to be strong in your faith, to know why you're swimming and to that determination to, to keep on going forward in the things of God. And there will, there will be conflict, and that is inevitable. So John 3, verse 19 says, it says, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. So as I said before, we need to be the lights that shine. Our life needs to be the contrast to the darkness 
we need to be shining lights to those round about us here and now in the times that we've been planted in and the areas that we've been planted in as well. British States and Edmund Burke said this, it's a, a wee statement which you'll all be very, very familiar with. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. What do I mean by that? Well, simply, we need to act out our faith, act out our doctrine, live our lives for the Lord to shine his light and to speak his truth to those round about us. Matthew 5.10 says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And sure, that's what we're seeking, to do the Lord's work, to shine his light, and really to forward his kingdom in the earth here today. Paul was a type of character, had the type of nature, he was all out for God. No matter the hard times that came across his path, he was all out for God every single day in every single situation, no matter the opposition that came against him. Persecution was not going to stop Paul from going hard after Jesus to share his faith and to put the gospel message out of there. Can we say the same for ourselves? Or when we come against a wee bit of the backlash, do we just kind of shrink back? and can they go a different path? Or do we continue swimming against that tide, shining the light in the areas where we can shine it? We need to be willing to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. Although that doesn't seem like a good thing to do, it really is, because blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I'm sure we want to claim that for ourselves. So if you feel like you're being squeezed at either side, you've got a kind of great weight pressed upon you, you know, God knows how you feel. He also knows what he's doing as well. And at the end of it, he will have his way. His glory will come if you're doing it for his purposes. All things will be used for his good and for his glory if you're doing it for his name and for his name's sake. And I'm sure that's the type of mentality that Apostle Paul had. He was going hard after all these things because he was doing it for the Lord, not for himself. And no matter what situation he found himself in, he found he always looked for a use in that situation. If he was imprisoned in prison, he would speak to the, the prisoners and share his faith. He would speak to the prison guards and share his faith there. He would just find, I suppose, fresh meat to evangelise to, no matter where he was, no matter his personal situation. One comment, commentator said about Paul that he could only view problems as opportunities with thorns on them. And I think that's quite a good way to, to think of it. These problems were just opportunities with thorns on them. And we can see that with his life. All the difficult situations that he found himself in, he found a way to, to have a purpose for the kingdom in it. So the fact is, I suppose, that if we suffer no persecution at all, if we suffer no persecution in our lives, then... We need to look at our spiritual life and actually assess where we are. Are we following after the Lord? Are we daily living for him? Are we sharing his, the faith and sharing scripture and sharing the gospel with those around about us? If we're not, then there's no persecution to come against us because we're not swimming against that pole. We're just today going with the flow of the world. It's essential we're going back, back the way. So we need to look at our spiritual barometer and see if we're sitting at cold or lukewarm if we are indeed sitting at hope for Jesus and moving forward with him. As a wee saying it goes, a ship is safe in harbour, but that's not what ships are made for. What are we made for? It's not to be safe and just to go against the flow of the world here, here today. It's to follow after Jesus, to seek his kingdom as his righteousness above all other things, and to share our faith with those round about us. So if we're free from spiritual attack, then we have to kind of think to ourselves, is that because we're really doing nothing for the Lord? And if that's true, then that's not what we're saved for. We're saved to share our faith. We're called to battle for the Lord, to fight on, to contend, to stand for the faith, once for all delivered to all the saints, as the wee letter of Jude tells us. We need to stand our ground in the here and now. And if we do have problems, we've got to get these into perspective. Again, think about our brothers and sisters in the kind of persecuted countries in the, in, across the world that are suffering daily severe things because of their faith. Their life is at risk, not just some of the kind of fringe inconveniences that we might suffer in this country here. 
But as I said, even in this country, we can see things escalating more and more. Where, you know, where darkness is seen as light and light is seen as darkness. Their values are turned topsy turvy in their heads. Because once upon a time, the kind of Christian values would be exalted and other things would be shunned. We see things going completely in the opposite direction. We need to be the people to stand up and stand for the word, stand for our Christian faith and Christian values in the here and now. And through it all, we just need to remember that God's in charge, that he knows, he sees, he understands, and he will give us strength in the times we find ourselves in here as well. So as we enter into the storms of life, you know, as we go into these storm waters swimming against the flow of the world and the culture today, we need to remember that we are not the captain of our ship. If we're born again, Jesus should be at the helm of our lives. And if our ship belongs to Jesus, if our life belongs to Jesus, if he's at the helm, then he's the captain, we are the cargo. We can trust Jesus to steer us, we can trust him to guide us, we can trust him, him to get us to our destination, no matter the storms of life that come against us, no matter how dark the world round about us gets. So Paul goes on in verse 13, he says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So wickedness will increase, it will get worse and worse, and this includes the, the, the charlatans and impostors, the evil people in the world today as well. Impostors, those that maybe look fine to begin with, you know, they look fine, they say the right things to begin with, but as we get further on, we see that they are just a sham. They're not really truly. Um, the people they're saying they are. And we see that very much within the church today. There's impostors within the church today. People that say they are ministers for the Lord. We can actually look at it. They're not standing for the Bible. They're not standing for Scripture. They're not standing for the truth of the Word. So essentially, these are the people, the impostors in the world, that are going to seek to draw people down their own paths. And those are the people that we need to be careful of as well to identify and to warn other people of, so as that others aren't led down the path of destruction. And it says as time progresses, these people will grow more and more, we'll see them more and more, it will happen more and more, because the world is going down this kind of spiral, as the ungodliness and the darkness gets worse and worse and worse. You know, we can see it now, you know, somebody says they're a minister, oh, they're a minister, you know, they're, they're following God. What they say must be right. So if they're saying it, we can just follow suit as well. We can trust what they say. Or it's a church, so oh, that's a church. Churches are places that, that follow God. So what that church does and what that church says is okay, we can do the same thing. But as we know, there's many ministers out there today, many churches out there today, that half of the Bible they're saying is not true, it's just allegory or they're ripping pages out and saying, you know, if times have changed, we don't need to do that anymore. We need to be the people that stick to the word of God. Like the Apostle Paul says, know your doctrine, you know, know your way of life, stick to the truth of the scriptures. And that's what we need to hold on to and swim forward with against the flow of the world today. Not only are these false teachers deceiving themselves, deceiving others, sorry, but they're also deceiving themselves. They are deceived by the very things they're telling other people is okay and they're showing other people in the here and now as well. Deception's a scary thing because if you're deceived, you're really unaware of the truth yourself. And there's many people today within the religious circle that are really unaware of the truth. Or if they're aware of it, they're turning their back on it. So we're in a very, very difficult and dangerous situation today, religiously, as we look across our culture. And we need to be the people that stand strong in the faith and don't deviate from it. To stand strong in the word of God and to hold on firmly with a grasp of the scriptures. It's not really, you know, a lot of people out there can be sin sincere. There's a lot of people sincerely, you know, serving, serving within churches and serving their communities and serving in different areas. But they're really missing the whole point because scripture isn't out the window. They're not holding on to the truth of the gospel, the gospel message. Jesus at the centre and the true gospel message there. And it's blind leading the blind. And we've got to be careful of that today. So with that, what, you know, what, what's the point in that? What's the point in saying all these things? Well, basically, Apostle 
Paul is telling Timothy about these last days. And he gives him this encouragement from verse 14. And he says in verse 14 onwards, but you, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. That from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in, which is in Christ Jesus. So Paul is encouraging Timothy to personally stay on track, to not turn aside to follow the ways of the evil men that Paul has just described. And we can really take that encouragement on board for us today as well, that we need to personally stay on track and not to turn aside to the wrong things and the wrong teachings that we see in the world today as well. Paul was very concerned to make sure that his students were going to remember the things that they've, they've learned and not to give way and to turn aside to the new fads of the day or the kind of different device of doctrines that other people would teach them, not to get pulled away from the core truths of the word. And here, as before, there's really warning Timothy against any kind of new or innovative teachings, new blessings, new signs and wonders, all the kind of guff that can come across our path. And really, that's what it is a lot of times in the kind of churches that we see today. There's always a new fad, always a new thing circling around the churches. And what it does is it takes a focus away from the core truths of the scriptures. When people are seeking after blessings or manifestations of these things, it doesn't matter because what we need to focus on is the core truth of the work of God. Jesus came to save souls. He died on the cross of Calvary. The atoning is an atoning work. The people need to come to Jesus to be saved, to have a place in eternity, to escape hell. You know, a lot of times, all that people are interested in is fad, fad following, to seek after all these new things because they want a blessing. You know, we all want a blessing, I suppose, in some shape or form, don't we? But we shouldn't negate that. We shouldn't negate the truth of the gospel for that. And today, what do we see? It's maybe not people chasing after gold feathers and feathers and gold dust and all these kind of things that we've seen in the past. But today, in our churches and things, we see mainly today the degradation of the sanctity of marriage and of life and these things that are going against the word of God. And we see people following after these things as truth. We see churches allowing them as truth and promoting them as truth. And these are things that we need to be careful of ourselves individually and I suppose as a fellowship as well, not to be pulled away from the core truths of scripture. You know, Paul's telling Timothy here, continue in the things that you have learned and been assured of and know from where you've learned them. Where does your faith, guys? Where's it based on? Where's it based on? Where's it based from? Is it something that somebody's told you that's okay? You know, believe in these things, follow after them. You know, have you studied the scriptures yourself and came to that conclusion? If you think something's okay, it's okay to live your life in some, some particular way, where are you getting that from? Is it scripture that's telling you that? Is it because some person within a church tells you? Come back yourself to the word of God to back, back up your faith and back up your beliefs. Maybe you should really question and test and hold everything to account before the word of God because it is the very breath of God, God's God-inspired word here. We've got a wee saying, if it's, not, if it's new, it's not true, and if it's true, it's not new. God's word doesn't change. You know, we see many things in the, the culture today where before churches have been standing against things, and we see that churches have now changed to allow certain things into play. Why? God's word hasn't changed, so what has changed is what we are allowing. And we need to be people of faith, people of God, and people of the word of God to stay true to what God has told us within his word here. Each generation is responsible for handing down scripture and the word of God unadulterated to the next. And that includes you and I. No, no from where you've learned your scripture. You know, we need to know where our faith is based on and pass that on to other people, to encourage other people to stand strong and true to the word of God. We get a scripture in Ephesians 6, verse 4. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Jewish parents are expected to teach their children the law from age five onwards. 
And I suppose that stands for us today as well. We need to train our kids up in the ways of the Lord. And not just our kids, we need to keep each other accountable to the ways of the Lord as well. Timothy was in the fortunate position. He'd followed the Apostle Paul for so long, learned from him, watched his example, his way of life, all backed up with scripture as well. And that was what he'd known through his, through his life. He was a third generation believer. His mother and his grandmother poured down scriptures and faith and knowledge into his life. He was taught faithfully by the two women in his life. We need to faithfully teach our children as well. Our physical children, our spiritual children, the children within the church, those round about us that we are connected with as well. And ultimately, Timothy could easily tell which doctrines were true and which were false because he knew the word of God. He knew scripture well. It was grounded in it. It was taught in it. And he could use scripture to identify truth and error. And that, I suppose, is our challenge today as well. When we come across things in the kind of spiritual sphere, the, the, kind of the church circles, can we tell truth from error because we know our word? Hopefully we can say yes to that answer. And that's where we really should be, to be able to take the word of God and use that to apply it to situations, to doctrines, to beliefs, to see if it matches up with what God has shown us within his word. That was how important scripture was for Timothy. And I suppose should be how important scripture is for us as individuals and our church as well. We need to put scripture on such a, give it such a high focus in our lives because that is what will keep us away from error and away from untruths. The only antidote to evil to this culture we're in today is the work of God and the spirit of God to do our work there. Verse 16 says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So all scripture we see is divinely inspired. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, literally meaning God breathed. So we need to give every scripture, every word of God, its rightful place. We can't discount some because it maybe sits a wee bit wrong with us. We're not quite sure about it or it maybe doesn't sit within the culture that we're in today. It's all God-breathed. We need to view it all as being God's word, to receive it as truth and to apply it to our lives and to apply it to the situations and the culture that we're in today as well. It's not just God's word, but it's an expression of his heart, his mind and his will as well. So we need to receive it all, to be the people are fully equipped with all of the instruction that God would give us. We're very familiar with Hebrews 4, verse 12. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. These are living, active words we need to apply to our own lives. We need to take them and use them, use them as a tool in the days that we're living in just now. They'll, they'll life breathe their God's living words to us. If we want to hear from God, our words, some guidance, an answer, we go to God's word and ask him to speak through that. From Genesis to Revelation, he can speak a word to us from what he's recorded in there for our benefit. I'm sure we've all kind of felt that before. You know, we can read the Bible and sometimes it feels like, you know, feels like dead words. We know it's not, but all of a sudden this scripture pops up and becomes alive to us and applies to the situation that we're in. Why? Because it's God's living word to us. It's his spirit that's behind it. All scripture is profitable. Every chapter, every verse, all of it. Not just the parts that we agree with and we like. We can't edit it to suit ourselves. If we miss parts out, essentially we're missing out God's conversation, his instructions and some of his encouragement to us as well. I like what Warren Mearsworth says about this passage here about all scripture being profitable. It says, profitable for doctrine and teaching, meaning what is right, for reproof, reproof for what is not right, for correction, how to get it right, and for instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. So God's word shows us what is right, what's not right, how to get it right, and how to stay right. So if we're not applying ourselves to God's word, how can we get it right, and how can we stay on the path that he wants us to be on? 
So if we want to be a person after the heart of the Apostle Paul here, somebody that's following after the law, we've got to be people of the world. Okay, we've got to be grounded in the world and to stick to it. And that will help us to swim forward against the tide of the world today. If we don't, then we'll be going backwards. We don't want that. We don't want, want that to be the case. David Livingston, you know, the, the famous missionary from Blantyre, he says this, I'll go anywhere as long as it's forward. And I wonder if spiritually we feel the same way as well. We want to press forward in the things of God, to swim forward against the flow of this world, rather than being pushed back with the darkness that comes against us. So we've got to ask ourselves, how do we use the Bible in our lives and what is the result? Are we seeing the result of the word of God in our lives? Do we see that allows us to determine the righteous things from the unrighteous things, the holy things from the unholy things, the good things from the bad things? Can the word of God do that in our lives? Is it doing that in our lives? And hopefully we can say yes to that question there. But no matter what, we've got to read the word of God. Sometimes it might feel as if it's going over your head, but I'm sure it's always doing something spiritual within our hearts and within our spirits as well. If I ask you what you ate three days ago on Wednesday evening, can you tell me? Or three weeks ago on Wednesday evening, I should say, can you remember what your food was? I'm sure you can't, but it gave you energy, it gave you nourishment, it kept you alive. The Word of God will do the same. You might not understand everything, but it will always do something within your being. It will always bring a goodness to your body. So, Timothy has been given great instruction from the Apostle Paul. Great instruction to keep on going forward in the things of God, to stay firm, to press forward against the flow of the world. And as we get just to the start of chapter 4, we'll just end in this verse here. Paul says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So Timothy's told to, you know, to stand in these things. I charge you, Timothy, I charge you to do these things. I command you to do them. And I suppose we can take that same commandment from the Apostle Paul here today to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, to convince, to rebuke, to exhort, with all long suffering and teaching. Essentially, you know, keep going at it, preach the word, have the word of God in your heart and get it out there to the people round about you. Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready to have a word for somebody, no matter what situation they're, they're dealing with. If somebody needs encouragement, have you a word for them? If somebody needs a bit of a boot up the backside, spiritually speaking, have you a wee a word for them there as well? Can you convince somebody about your faith? Can you exhort somebody to move forward? Can you do it all with long suffering and with teaching? Timothy has such a great example from the Apostle Paul. We also need encouraged to stick with it. I'm sure we all need a bit of encouragement in our daily lives as well to stick with things also. But we can preach the word. We can be ready in season, out of season. We can rebuke, we can exhort, we can have long suffering and we can teach those round about us. But we need to be willing to do it. We need to have something inside us to give out to other people. We've got to feed ourselves in order to be able to have something to feed other people with also. So be ready, be ready no matter what comes across your path. Be watchful and do what the Apostle Paul tells us to do here as well. As the chapter goes on, he tells us just about how dark the times will be get, where people will not endure sound doctrine and all these things. And I think that is a situation we find ourselves in today as well. The Apostle Paul will go on to tell Timothy, fulfil your ministry, do what you're called to do. And today, as a, the wee Nike logo would say, just do it. Today, just do it. But the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy to do us, we just need to do it as well. To be the people who stand firm in our faith, that won't be wavered, that will go and do what the Apostle Paul tells them to do, to swim against the flow of the tide today. This kind of culture that comes against us in opposition, we need to stand strong and firm against it and swim forward with 
the Holy Spirit within us and with the strength of the Lord. The best type of Christianity is not only taught, but it's also caught as well. So if somebody's going to catch something from your life, what's it going to be? Is it going to be a wee sniffle? Is it going to be this kind of total body invasion where they get from you? A bug so strong will invade their full being. What kind of faith is somebody going to catch from you? And we can make, really think about that. Shine your light forth to those round about us. As a wee pattern thought from Martin Luther, live as Christ died yesterday, rose this morning, and is coming back tomorrow. If we live that way, someone's going to catch something mighty from you in a faith sense. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the Apostle Paul and for the words that he has recorded here for Timothy and for us today. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to help us to be like these people here. Maybe, Father God, can follow, follow forward with the correct doctrines and the manner of life to live our lives out in the right way, Father. That people can catch something from us, Lord. Catch a glimpse of our faith, catch a glimpse of glory of the Lord. That people will see something in our lives that they want to have. We give you thanks, Lord, for your scripture, for your word that's been given by inspiration of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Your word can do all things. It can, it can rebuke us, it can give us correction, it can instruct us, Lord. It will make us complete and equipped for every good work. So help us, Lord, to be people of your word, to dig deep into it, Lord, to apply it to our lives and to, to be planted in it, Father, so that we can be ready in season and out of season. When we come across people that are needing help or encouragement or strength, that we can speak forth of your word to help them in their situations and help them forward with their lives. Help us, Lord, not to go with the flow of this world, but to swim against it, Father. Give us the strength to do that and the determination to do it, Lord. And we give you thanks, your Lord, to show us what this world is going to be, Father. We understand that it's going to become more ungodly. It's going to get darker and darker, Father. But help us to be the lights that shine in the, in the darkness. That shine the Lord Jesus Christ and point people to you, to your Son, to salvation. So we give you thanks, Lord, for your work today and just help us to understand it, Father, and to apply it daily to our lives. Help us to be people of the world and to people that shine your truth and your life to those around about us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Cheers, Sam. Thanks, Colin. Good word, strong word this morning. Paul was never, uh, he never held back about what he wanted to say. And I encourage you all this morning after Colin's word there, just, you know, be, be the Bereans, be Acts 1711, check the scriptures daily and make sure what you're being told is the truth. We're trying our best to say to you that all scriptures God breathed and we, we thank Colin for that this morning. You know, it was just crossed my mind there when he was speaking that. When Jesus was asked, you know, what was the greatest commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy understanding. And love each other as you love yourself. Love your neighbor. And I think if the motive behind us is love all the time, we'll never go far wrong, even in the heart of persecution. So thanks again, Colin, for that. Let's just pray as we finish, because I forgot a couple of prayers I wanted to do. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for Colin for his work this morning and for Robin for the lovely praise and worship songs we did. And Lord, I just pray for, for Esther as she heads off to see her family, Lord, at this time. And for Sarah that you would bring her back safely, Father, and that you would just bless them, keep them, and watch over them. And Lord, for all of us here, Lord, help us to love you with all our heart, soul, and understanding, Lord. And help us to love our neighbours as ourselves, Lord, and to bless you in that. If we do these things, Lord, we can't be going far wrong. And help us again, Lord, in the persecution that assails us at this time, Father, the, the subtle stuff that comes in and just compromises the word a little bit. So, Lord, keep us strong. We thank you for the word from Colin this morning, Lord. And as we part, I ask that you would part as we are blessed, Father. And as many will probably be going on holiday this week, I ask you to bless them and keep them safe, Lord. So we thank you again for this opportunity to gather together, Lord. And we just ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Just up uh, during the week, it's going to be the prayer meeting as normal on Wednesday. 
And again, if there was anybody that was uh, wanting to tune into Neil Brown Riggs' funeral on Tuesday at 1.15, I've got a link for it. Uh, if you drop me an email, I'll forward it to you. Uh, so thanks again, guys. Thanks for turning up. Without you, it wouldn't be the same. So God bless you all this morning and goodbye. See you later. Bye.